So here we have a time frame. It's a time Skylon. Uh, it's a 2018 model. It was sent to me by a gentleman called James. Uh, I'm just looking up on my screen here the details. He um, basically what happened was the front derailleur hanger. Um, these inserts here were put in the wrong place um, for some strange reason. He doesn't un he doesn't know why, but um, that seems quite unusual. You think they have a jig for that, but anyway, um, they were put in the wrong place. So they sent him a new frame, and he, he had to basically destroy this one. And if you notice, you can see a cut here and here. So the the head tube section of the frame had to be cut out and then they sent him a new frame so um he contacted me quite some time ago actually i'm looking at my emails here it's um it was back in Fe february 2018 so it was a brand new frame at the time it's taken me uh, a little while to get to doing this cut up and review um but uh but here it is so he got a brand new frame this one came to us and uh, I cut it up just recently and we're going to have a look and see how well it's made on the inside. So uh, let's get to it. So here we can see the inside of this time frame. So time frame. <laughs> um, so the first thing you'll notice is that it's quite uh, it's quite smooth and clean on the inside. You don't have the wrinkles that we often see in a bladder molded prepreg frame. The other thing you'll notice is it's got a woven fabric finish on the inside instead of the unidirectional material. So now there's a number of reasons for that. Um, the way this is made is with resin transfer molding. So what is happened and time have got videos on their website they they show a video of the how they manufacture um, these these bikes but basically they they braid uh, dry fiber around a mandrel and um, and then once that is once that's on, uh, all um, laid up around the mandrel properly they then place that mandrel inside the mold and then close the mold and inject resin under high pressure to fully wet out the fiber and 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 make the composite so instead of pre-preg where the resin is in the the, the fiber um, and then it's in sheets and it's laid up in this process all the dry fiber is placed uh, into the shape first and then it's placed into the mold and the resin is injected so it's a completely different type of process so there's pros and cons to that which we'll go into these slides so the um the you know the one thing that you will see is some remnants of the mandrel and um in this case they use they use a wax uh, and then once the um once the part is cured, they can uh, melt the wax out. So they heat up the part. The max, the wax melts, drains through, you know, out of the frame, and then they can recast that wax into mandrels again and keep reusing that wax. So it's it's sort of a, a bit more friendly, uh, environmentally friendly in that sort of sense because you're reusing the wax as opposed to a uh, an EPS or you know, polystyrene type um, form which then gets dissolved chemically and cannot be reused typically so um, so there are some very small areas of wax uh, remnants sort of left left in the bike um, where you know for whatever reason it didn't all all come out so you can you can see that so um, let's have a closer look at some of these areas this is the uh the bottom bracket shell 
um, from the outside and you can see a um, the woven the woven finish uh, sort of you know, let's get a nice view of it here one thing you will notice is that the wall thickness so that wall thickness there is very uniform um, now that's a byproduct of of the resin transfer molding process so basically you don't get the variations in wall thickness uh, as you would with um, you know, with a bladder type process because the fiber is placed in position and then in, once the resin is injected it's all um, once the the mandrels are all uniform uh, exact dimensions and that controls the thickness so you typically don't get as much fiber movement uh, it can happen um, but it's typically less so you end up you've effectively got a tooled surface on both sides as opposed to with bladder you've only got the tooled surface on on the one side and you've got the bag which is flexible on the other side And here's a, a look of that same area from the inside. So you can see how there's a separate piece which is all co-molded, and, and you, you can you can see the the radius through there. So the the bottom bracket shell um, is all nice and round and and concentric and all that sort of stuff um, because it's shaped around the mandrel. The resin flows in there and you don't get any of those sort of thickness variations and thermal stresses and all that sort of stuff. So in terms of, um, in terms of the bottom bracket uh, alignment, it should be pretty good. Um, I haven't measured it with instruments, um, but you know, it's, uh, you, don't, you certainly don't get the, the, the thermal variations uh, during cure because it's, you don't have such a, a difference in, in temperature with cure cycles, etc. Um, here you can just see a little bit of the remnants of the wax right up in the top corner there. Also a little bit through here. And um, yeah, but yeah, as, as you'll notice, it's, um, it's a molded finish on, on the inside. So, you know, much much cleaner than a lot of the bottom brackets that we've seen um, you know, on, on some of the previous frames that we've cut up. So looking into the junction for the, uh, for the, the chainstay. Now, the chainstay here, it, it's, um, I've, I've cut it off, but I've just sort of rested it in position. But I wanted to show you that there's a rib, which you can see here. which is uh, molded into the, the chainstay, which is then bonded into that bottom, bottom bracket junction. It's just, so it's secondary bonded. So they're making the front triangle, um, the chainstays and the seat stays are then, are then bonded in as a second step. But, the, um, but I wanted to show you that rib because to, to make that rib with a, um, with a pre-preg, sort of uh, manufacturing system is much more complex but it's actually quite simple to do with the resin transfer molding because all you need to do is have have the channel in the in the mandrel you place the fiber in that and when you inject it the uh, the resin fills the, the remainder of that cavity and and wets it all out um, and you're getting the pressure effectively from the injection pressure so the um, much much easier to do these sorts of ribs um, with a resin transfer molding process so you'll see there's there's ribs I'll show you some ribs in other areas of the frame as well so now that I've taken the um, the chain stay cut section away to show the inside of that um, of, of that junction and you can see the bond interface is um is through here and through here um i'll just erase that again so you can see it clearly but there's um there's no voiding um 
just bigger it's maybe a tiny tiny little one just just here um right on the, at, at that edge but the bond line is is very good now because your the front triangle is made on a mandrel you can control the dimension the internal dimensions uh, of that bond interface very accurately and also you can control the outer shape of the chainstay very accurately so you you've got good good control of that bond line thickness um, now that's a real key for um, for good structural bonding to have uniform adhesive thickness so that can be maintained well and you can see clearly in this case it, it they, they don't have to allow for variations in those mating surfaces which then gets filled with uh, with adhesive or in most cases uh, doesn't they don't put enough adhesive in and you get voids in those areas so they've got really good control of the, over the adhesive you can see the adhesive um, residue that's so um, sort of around around through here which has been um, which has been pushed through um, and all that look all that looks pretty good so I did a review of a time frame some time ago and in some of the adhesive joints there were some voids um, but in um, yeah, I mean that was a much older one. In this one, I haven't seen any evidence of that. Here's another view from the same area. Again, you can see the, all the all the uniform section, um, nice uh, nice woven pattern. Yeah, it's um, all the sort of features we've, we've been talking about. So it just gives you another another shot. Um, of, of that area and finally another view of this area now it's um it is a really critical area on the bike and we do see a lot of problems on um on bikes in this area so i'm sort of really emphasizing that but you get a really nice view of that bond line uh, thickness control through here um you can also see it through there and um, and through there as a tiny little void right there but um i mean it's, it is close to the edge um well, actually it's not close to the edge because i've cut it only close to the edge because i cut the section out so um a little void like that you know being contained um away from the edge is not um not that much of a, a problem at all um i wouldn't be too concerned about that you the other thing you can notice is the different um the different weave pattern um so through this you know this area of the bike and up through here is um there's a different weave to what you're seeing in the chain stay through here so um you know it's a it's just a different fiber a different fiber type um it's a sort of coarser a coarser weave it also looks like they've got some you know maybe some elastic or something in it to um, assist with the shaping of that and they do show that in their own video on um on how they how they make these bikes so here moving down towards the uh the rear dropout and you can see that um sort of from from about this area onwards they've um, they've used a, a a finer weave fabric so it's a lighter weight fabric um now they've done that because you've got uh the a cable exit port sort of in this region here and um and that's all molded in and it it actually looks it looks better in real life than what it does in this photo but um it's it, so that that port's molded in they're using a, a finer fabric so it it goes into those corners um in a, in a nicer manner um less likely to wrinkle and 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 crease etc and also you know giving a um where the bond to the to the dropout is and i'll talk about the dropout in a minute um you, you you're getting um you know a lighter a lighter fabric can often assist you with the bond so looking at the dropout um it's a compression molded carbon dropout so 
The advantage of that is that you don't have a galvanic corrosion. And, um, you know, we often see uh, if you're using an aluminium dropout bonded into carbon, that you can get a breakdown of the bond interface and, and the dropout uh, comes loose and it gets disbonded over time. So having a, um, having a full carbon dropout uh, alleviates that issue. It's just, turns it into a non-issue. Um, the, you know, we, one of the things we have seen with full carbon dropouts is that they don't last very, you know, very well. They, the, the surface wears um, you know, from the skewer um, clamping pressure, etc. Um, obviously, this is a brand new frame; it hasn't, hasn't been hasn't been used, so we don't really know what sort of life. Uh, that that would have but um so if you've got one of these bikes you know put in the comments how you find the dropouts if you've had any issues with those but um this this one it it, it actually to me it looks pretty good um it looks it looks like it's made well it it um it doesn't have some of the uh some of the issues that i've seen in in, in other other dropouts so and you've got the you know nice replaceable hanger. The uh, the hole, the bolt, the bolt hole is over here, um, which gives it in a nice sort of thick area, so it's nice and reinforced and less less likely to break. You know sometimes you see really stupid designs, and I've done videos on this where they'll they'll put the hole to secure the hanger, sort of like here. And then you end up putting a hole right at a stress concentration in a thin area, and then surprise, surprise, that section breaks off. So um, overall, this design looks pretty good. And if they've used if they've used high compressive strength resin and got good fiber density, the, I can't see any real issues with that. The um, and then yeah, the same with the bond to the to the seat stay up here. Um, all that was um, all pretty good. You can see a bit of a void in the adhesive there, but which is which is minimal. You've got really good bond area there, so um, all that looks good to me. So moving up the seat stay, and uh, again I've placed the other half of that's cut away um, next to it, just so you can see both both sides. Again, all nice and very clean, and um, and then you can see the bond interface. So here's there's um, adhesive spew out, and uh, but yeah, nice nice good surface through that. Okay, so here we have the seat stay uh, seat stay junction to the seat tube. You can see the the bonded joint sort of through here. Um, adhesive spew out there again really nice control of the of the bond line thickness no voids in the adhesive all that looks really clean you've got nice sort of steps in terms of the ply drop-offs sort of here 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 etc um, you've also got a rib through here which is same as what we had on the chainstay and that's where the brake bolt uh, goes through and that acts as a bulkhead to stiffen that area and provide really good compressive load uh, strength through that. So that's a really nice feature. The um, the only sort of negative thing, and you might be able to see if you pay close attention, but there's there's a crack there. So and that's basically you've got fibers running down here and you've got fibers running through here and you've got this basically stress concentration right there and you've got a little bit of a crack indication uh, popping up there so um, now I'm not sure if that happened uh, due to cutting the bike in half because um, all it takes is um, a little bit of flex and and you can basically pop that that um, that edge open because there isn't any fiber on it you're relying purely on the resin for the interlaminar shear strength um, and when it's a closed structure uh, as as it would be during manufacture 
it can't flex in that manner so you you can't get that sort of thing uh, happening so hard hard to know um what if that was the case here whether it was due to flex during cutting or you know there's other reasons you can get resin shrinkage and things like that so um yeah we need probably a little bit more information on that very hard to determine that um you know with with a scan you know the it's such a close uh, sort of closed area that um it it'd be hard hard to find that non destructively as well and here we are looking up the c tube so so we've got a like a wheel cut out area sort of the contour here um again all looks nice and clean nice uniform weave um yeah all that braided braided fabric and um yeah no resin ridges or anything like that so the um because with the way it's the way it's made you can have um like the resin or the wall thickness is controlled by the tooling so the um everything's going to be uniform however often your fiber density particularly like because you're using a, a woven material is going to be less than what a unidirectional prepreg material is so you know if you, typically you're running sort of fiber volumes sort of maybe up to up to 60 percent with a woven whereas you can get sort of close to well, even over 70 percent with um with a well compacted unidirectional laminate so so you are running a little bit higher resin content um, but you're reducing uh, you know you, you're reducing voids and things like that so there, there is a, a little bit of a trade-off in the mechanical properties so you know the the ultimate structure is is in unidirectional and knowing all the loads and optimizing your fiber angles to meet those loads and all that sort of stuff um, and so this is is less than than optimum from that point of view however from a practical point of view because you don't then have some of the production faults that you can have with the unidirectional so you can get you know planar voids and things like that in this process due to the resin injection pressure you won't get you won't get laminate voids if um if if it's been done um, and monitored correctly so the the void can't form under that high pressure resin uh, injection type process so um so as long as you don't have a leak in the mold then you won't have uh, you won't have those sorts of voids like you can get with a pre-preg uh, pre-preg laid up um, part which traps those those voids uh, within the uh, within the layers so here we have another view of the um, around the front the railer hanger area and you can see the a bit of wax residue sort of through here um, and uh, all the molded in features for the shape so so the um, the clearance for the front derailleur hanger the uh, those the rib nut inserts are, are placed quite well even if apparently they are in the wrong place for whatever reason um, but again that all that looks all that looks quite nice uh, there's there's no uh, no real issues there a little bit of resin build up just just through here so um, if for example if there's um, in the mandrel in the wax mandrel if there's a void in when they cast that mandrel then resin can fill can fill that space as well so you know you can get a little bit of resin uh, resin build up like that um, but as I said before you it's very difficult to get to get voids uh, if if all the pressures are correct and then looking up the down tube 
um, which sort of sounds a bit funny saying up the down tube, but um, that's uh, again you've got the the braided weave, minimal variations. You know you you can see there's sort of a line, a step line here where there's a, a step in the mandrel to uh, compensate for the thickness. So the thickness through here is it's thicker than what it is there so there's a step in the mandrel and an extra pliers placed on the mandrel sort of through this region to reinforce that junction a bit more so in this area here we've got um i'll show you i'll draw a little line here so the um right in this region there you can see how there's a little bit of distortion in the in the weave of the fabric so in you can see that, that you know we're looking at normal 45 degrees sort of through here but you can see the distortion at different angles down in this area here so there's a number of reasons for that you know you can get some distortion during handling or you can get um, some fiber wash due to the injection pressure um, so I mean that's that's pretty minor. It's not nearly as significant as what you can get with a deep wrinkle in a um, unidirectional prepreg layup, for instance. So if, you know I've shown that I've shown that sort of stuff before when you get a deep fold in the material. So uh, depending on how deep that goes um, would depend how, how um, detrimental it is to its performance. But um, looking at that, it's probably quite minor. So then up to the head tube and um, you can see where the head tube was cut off to um, to, to appease the uh, warranty replacement um, although they could have just sent me the complete bike and and I could have cut it in half for them but yeah maybe I didn't want to do that um, so you can see again it's it's all pretty clean there's some differences in the weave uh, so there's obviously a, a join sort of here and also here so where the the tubes the top tube and, and down tube respectively um, join the head tube the um, you can see all these sort of lines that's not a very good not a very straight line but um, it, all these sort of striations uh, through here so um, I'd, I'd imagine that's some sort of elastic um, sort of binder or some some material to maintain the shape of the head tube around the mandrel when they're when they're laying up the preform um you know so everything's in 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 the right position so uh but again you know very clean um very detailed there is a rib through here and i'll um i'll show you some more of that um in the next slide so the rib is the same as what I showed you further back um, in the in the in the chainstay and the seat stay region. So there's there's two ribs actually on um, in in the head tube down tube junction. So one um, so I mean as you can see I cut I cut down the bike down the middle and and so there's one on this sort of each each side of 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 the cut. So sort of a double reinforcement there. So um that really reinforces that area significantly so you know as we saw in the chinarello video where they didn't have much material through here and then that's where it failed so um the other thing you've note is just that line through there and um yeah and that that would just be like where there's a join in the mandrel and there's a little bit of extra resin but um but all that looks looks quite uniform. I'd um, I'd say the the um, the bearing seat, sort of this area through here, that'll all be moulded in around the mandrel and um, in a similar way to the bottom brackets done. So that all should be pretty good. The um, yeah, apart from that, not much else uh, to comment on. The you know, there's no voids, no no wrinkles. Um, yeah you get a closer look sort of through here at that join between the different uh the different fabrics because obviously you can't uh, braid the entire structure 
uh, in one piece sort of cost effectively. Uh, I mean, it is possible to do that. There are some 3D weaving type processes now where you can effectively weave or knit a complete uh, preform and, and then inject it. So there's no actual joins uh, of fiber anywhere. So you have continuous fiber running through the whole structure, which is which is optimum. But that's um, that's quite a complex thing to do on, uh, on on larger parts. But that's where things are going in terms of preforms and and uh, resin transfer molding, etc. Here we have sort of a, a another view of that area. You can see you can see the rib again through here. Uh, you know, nice sort of consistent join, sort of around that that headset. A little bit of a, a little bit of a, um, uh, you mean you sort of call it dag, sort of through here. With now there is a cable port there, and so that would be allowed for in the mandrel, and um, and so you've got a little bit of excess resin through there. But again, that's sort of no real, no real issue. But um, yeah, you know you can. You, you can see it's um, all, all that area is all pretty, pretty good. The upper upper uh, junction is uh, again similar, not really you know much much to make a note of. The uh, the upper bearing seat is sort of same as the uh, the lower the lower end and also uh, the bottom bracket. So again you know they'd have a mandrel which is a one-piece mandrels going through um you know so they so it's, everything's concentric and aligned and then once you inject it's um it, it's all good so again you, know, you see the the join sort of through here for the top tube to the um to the head tube material So this is the two the two halves. So I, I sort of thought I'll add that, um, you know, so you can see that there's a rib on on one side here, and and the other side there. Um, there are some holes, sort of for ports. So you've got like a, a cable, a cable port like a DI2 cable port here. Um, also a brake rear brake cable here. There were a few sort of loose fibers from that drilling process. Um, a little bit of tear out. Uh, there, there was also an extra patch of um, of fabric. You can just sort of make it out um, sort of through there. Extra patch of fabric to reinforce where that hole is. So, um, but again, so nothing uh, nothing to stand out. You know, it's all it's all very uniform. Here we have a closer look uh, at at that top. Top junction, a little bit of extra resin. Also, you can see in his corner here how how it's a bit clear, so it's sort of yellowy tint. So there's the, there isn't any fiber in that. So the the fiber for that reinforcement rib. Uh, so there's a ribs at the top of, at the top of the headset um, as well as the as the lower end. Um, there isn't any fiber, so the fiber sort of goes. Sort of through there, and then that little corner on the end, which is in in the box, is is pretty much just filled with resin. So, um, you know, that's that's not ideal, but then it's it's not a deal breaker either. So there's not you know not that much of a, a problem. The resin's obviously much has got much less uh, mechanical properties than the fiber. So typically about one percent of the strength and stiffness. So um, yeah, you know you. You, you, you're going to lose a little bit, but that area will be significantly stiff anyway. There's, there'll be no issue with stiffness through that uh, through that section. Looking along the uh, the top tube, again nothing of note here. It's all very uniform. The uh, yeah, you know, no wrinkles, no no creases. It's yeah, you know, just that uniform braided uh, braided finish. So moving into the top tube to C tube junction, and uh, and you can clearly see the step uh, in the in the wall thickness. So it's like a like a butting on a on a metal frame, sort of that line there. Now that white um, 
the white material it'd be some sort of maybe double-sided tape or something to hold the extra plies in position um, while you're laying up the, the plies around the mandrel prior to injection so when you're making the preform um, you know you can clearly see the, the thickness the thickness change at that step now it is typically better to stagger those to stagger thickness changes so uh, you know like on a on a metal tube you you wouldn't have a ideally you wouldn't have a step a hard step you'd have a gradual taper and um, ideal, ideally with um, with composites you want the uh, each step to be the thickness of the ply that's sort of the minimum you know that that, that you can do so um, so I'm not sure what the the material thickness is in this case um, whether it's just one additional ply and it's it's quite a heavy ply or or, or multiple ply so um, you'd need to do some further sort of analysis on the on the layup to to determine that um, you do see there's a crack indication through here and also the corresponding lower lower junction so as what was noted in the seat stay to seat tube junction i'm not sure if that flexed open um, during the cutting process because during during the um well as a complete closed structure when it's a complete bike that the loads on that would be um would be contained much better so the only way you could really pop that you know get a crack propagating up like that is like if you crash the bike heavily or if you um, for instance drove if you had the, the bike on the roof racks and you drove into the garage and it impacted the, the the seat uh, or top of the seat tube and so you had a real you know a force sort of going that way at the um, at the at the seat at the top of the seat um, which could then propagate through there so you've got um, as I said before you've got the interlaminar shear strength of the resin holding you know those those plies together now typically but not always and there's a lot of work being done in this area that the injection resins uh, often have lower mechanical properties than a, um, a pre-preg you know, high temperature curing resin so uh, it's a bit of a generalization um, I don't like making generalizations like that but you know often the um, the, the cure temperatures are, um, aren't, aren't as high so you don't get as much cross-linking you can't some of the additives it's more difficult to add additives to an injection resin because often they can um, almost be filtered out during the injection process so you know, as as the resin flows through the fiber, um, the, the fiber preform, it's effectively like a like a filter, and it can um, so you can often end up with a lot of the additives, like toughening additives, which are effectively just small, very small rubber spheres. They they can um, they can all sort of collect near the near the injection port and you don't get them in other areas so again bit of a generalization i don't like doing that but um yeah i'm i'm not that surprised to see you know where there's sort of more stress concentrations and things like that you you can get those sorts of uh things happening but as i said if it's a closed structure then the the forces to do that is um the forces to do that are going to be different so so the whole frame is just this satin black and um, there's no sort of markings on it as you as you saw in the in the front uh, in the first slide the only the only marking on it um, is uh, the UCI sticker uh, the UCI label and um, and this where they have the French French tricolor and um, a little window of, of fabric and RTM the rest of the bike is is all black so um, you know there are some decals on it under the black which um, you can see a slightly raised 
it says uh, Skyline on the on the seat tube, and um, and then it has a Time logo on the um, also on the seat tube, but that's it. So that's a look at the uh, the Time Skyline 2018 model. So thanks to uh, to James for sending that in. Um, you know, it was a brand new bike. Um, as we said, the uh, front derailleur hanger was not in the right place for whatever reason. They gave him a new one and he, um, he donated it to us to, to cut up. So thank you very much for that. Um, as we're, one of the things I'm finding is as these, um, the new bikes are harder to get these days because most of the brands want them back. I don't know if it's a, if it's a plot they don't want me to get them. Um, anyway, it's harder to get, it's harder to get new bikes. Um, so back, yeah, back, back to the time. The, um, it was significantly different to what we've seen in other cut-up reviews, and that's due to the process. So the resin transfer molding process is it's a completely different process. It's, it's much more tooling intensive. So you've got the tooling for the outer uh, surface, but you also have all the tooling for the inner surface. So in this case, the mandrels are made out of wax, so they, they can be removed readily um, and, and, and reused, as I spoke about. So you, you need a mold to cast that wax. So, you know, there's extra, significantly extra tooling required uh, to, to do that, as opposed to a bladder molding process. Um, although with the EPS type processes, you know, they, they, they're sort of approaching that, uh, that level as well. So, but with, uh, with the injection, with the resin transfer type injection process, um, you typically won't have voids and porosity unless you have a leak in, in the tool. And that should all um, be identified in your process control, you know, with injection pressures and all that sort of stuff. So, so you won't find the, the typical sort of problems that we've, that we've seen in other frames. Um, there are other types of flaws that you can get though. So if you can still have problems, um, but they're different sorts of problems. So just be, be aware of that. So the, um, the most important thing with this process is to get your preform right. So the fiber needs to be placed accurately um, and, and then it needs to stay in that position during handling, you know, basically putting it into the tool or you know, up until the point it's, uh, it's injected. So, you know, once you close the mold, once, once you put the preform in the mold, close the mold, um, you don't know, if, you know what's going on um, until you pull the part out after the injection. So now the other difference is that you're, you've got a, a two component resin Typically, um, there are some single part injection resin, but most of them are, are, are two part. So the mixing of the resin is important. It needs to be accurately metered and, and mixed and you know, all those sort of aspects. Um, obviously, another problem you can have is if, you, if you've got some contamination of the fiber and so then the resin doesn't bond correctly and all those sorts of things. So. Um, so there, there still are a range of process problems. However, they're just different to what you'd see with a pre-preg bladder molded type, type part. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. If you've got any questions or comments, put them down below. And um, yeah, I'm not sure what review's coming next, what I've got. I've got a few, um, I've got a few bikes available. I've got a Madone. Um, yeah, a bunch of other stuff. Anyway, we'll uh, see you again soon for another video. Okay, bye.